Hi everyone in Cloud Computing and welcome to episode 58 of the Cloud Computing Training Show featured on YouTube and podcast with Brad Nelson and internationally recognised and the world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, Cloud Computing Recruitment Specialist, placing great people in cloud, IoT, FinTech and AI. This week we're excited to have James Staten back on our show as our special guest. James is the Vice President and Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. James is a cloud expert with over 20 years experience in marketing, business development, corporate strategy and cloud-based innovations. In this week's show we'll be talking about every tech professional whether IT ops or dev security needs to modernize their skills to raise their career to the next level. Hi Dave and James, a warm welcome to you both. It's great to have you back on the training show this week. Yeah, it's great to have James on the show, man. He's rocks. Thanks so much, guys. It's such a pleasure to be with you all the time. Yeah, it truly is great to have you back on, James. I really fully appreciate your time on this Sunday afternoon. Uh, so, yeah, it's great to have you back on. And, and you know, it's, we've, we've recorded some great shows this week already. So there's some really cool content coming out there. And if uh, everyone watching this show right now, the training show, skip back to the C-Suites and the Australia show because we covered some really great topics in quite a lot of depth, actually, as well. So, um, And also we've got this uh, show we're doing after this as well called The Innovation Show. So we're really looking forward to having James as part of that series as well. So that's going to be, uh, yeah, really cool. So James, thanks again for your time and also for yourself, Dave. So look, uh, we've got an opening question uh, to, to start the show off as always. Uh, you know, so I guess we'll kick it to you first then, James. Um, how should sort of you go cloud plus, uh, you know, or ultra cloud or whatever you want to call it to raise your value within not only your own company, but also to get value to the, the whole of your career going forward? Yeah, it's really important that people who are investing in cloud skills and cloud capabilities look beyond the basic IaaS services and the PaaS services that most of these clouds have and start embracing a lot of the emerging technologies and new services that are available in the clouds as well. Because by extending their skills, they can actually get other people in the organization to see the values cloud can bring bring up new value capabilities that you've never seen before, that your company's ever seen before, and then ultimately drive tech-driven innovations for your company. Yeah, I couldn't, I, I can't disagree with any, any of that. I mean, ultimately, when I talk to people and looking to hire people, and um, I look at really kind of the profile of skills, they normally have an inventory of things that they know I want to hear, but ultimately, this is about them being innovative with the technology in the space. So if they're, you know, certified, you know, AWS architects, for example, I always say, well, what, how did you use your AWS architecture skills to create something net new, you know, that had a positive benefit of it on, on your business? And whether it's someone who's, you know, 20, 30, 40, you know, 20 years into the career or, you know, two days in the career, I think it's something that we're missing. I think ultimately we have to ask the question, that it's not enough to, in essence, have these skills, which are pretty easy to obtain these days because we have great, you know, video courses and things like that, and you know, automated, you know, testing systems and education systems, things like that. But how do you become innovative with the technology and kind of take it to the next level? And I, I, I think we're 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 kind of missing that going forward. And and so, I understand that I can probably, you know, make one hundred fifty thousand dollars of a twenty something with you know, deep, you know, you know, uh, mad, you know, AWS skills in the space. But, you know, if you're not able to understand how to take that technology to battle within the business and kind of make it count, uh, I think that's really kind of a missing point uh, that we're looking at. And that may be a different, you know, take and most people who are just trying to look to um, the nine to five and, you know, do their job and go home and, you know, do whatever the other passions that they have in life. But, I just kind of keep coming back to that as a core motivator for people to understand and to, for people to get additional skills. What do you think, James? Yeah, and here's a couple examples. So if you're very IT, IT operations centric in your skills, don't just concentrate on how to move applications into containers, um, how to host them on the platform, but also take a look at edge computing and take a look at software defined networking and how those can actually empower the applications to give greater experiences, to be closer to where the customers really need them, and to be able to scale those applications across lots of geographies. And if you're a developer, it's obviously very important that you understand containers, it's very important that you understand microservices, but you also wanna be looking at how can I empower the marketing organization, the sales organization, and other people with low-code platforms? 
And a lot of developers oftentimes don't embrace low code platforms. They're like, what do you mean I'm gonna let marketing create an application? Well, they're not gonna create a full application. They're gonna use low code to create a new user experience that ties in, if you do it right, to the broader applications that you're managing and that you're building. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think that, you know, ultimately going forward, we have to train people around not only getting the, and obtaining the skills, but, you know, how to use the skills in uh, a net new innovative way. And I think that's something that's missing in the marketplace right now. And, uh, you know, the thing is, when I hire people, I always hire people that are thinking that way. And therefore, I surround my people with a lot of people, I surround myself with a lot of people who are thinking that, they have to understand how to take the technology and do something different with it somebody else hasn't done before. But most organizations that I work with, um, you know, typically clients that I deal with, you know, don't really have that kind of fire in the belly. And, and I, I don't know how to get them there. I don't know how to get there thousands of people within the organization, not only to get to the cloud computing skills, because I can get them to cloud ops and how to do DevOps and you know how to do uh, container-based development and whatever kind of tactical skills they need to kind of take things to the next level. But to get people thinking about rethinking the business around the new technology, leveraging the technology as kind of a, a weapon uh, that's going to allow them to kind of take things to market they couldn't before, you know, that's, that's really kind of what's missing in the space. And, and going forward, we need training plans and skill gaps analysis, you know, skill gap analysis and things like that. But thinking about the innovation, the creativity, the net new stuff, I'm not sure how to instruct people how to make that happen. What do you think, James? Yeah, you do want to really, you know, try to work with your business to understand what are the new things customers need from us? What applications, what services, and so forth are they already using? Um, same with your ecosystem, because a lot of the partners you work with, they're running on the cloud and they're taking advantage of these services. And if you were taking advantage of these services as well, you could integrate with them more effectively. And so these are mechanisms you can use to get your bosses to say, yeah, let me have some time to learn these skills. Help, help me do this and here's the benefits gonna come to the overall organization. And then you may also see circumstances in which you've learned these new skills, but then your company decides they don't want to talk about the fact that you've done this. They don't want to turn those services on because oftentimes when you're driving innovations, a lot of your innovation efforts will fail. They won't align to what you're doing. That doesn't mean that you should not be able to promote to the broader world that your company is investing in these capabilities and that you have these skills. And a good way to show that off is to go to GitHub and go up there and document what you've learned, how you're using it, how it can be applied. And that becomes very effective in showing what you know, what your company knows, um, or if your company's not comfortable with it, what other people can learn about you and put you in a role in a new company where you can be that next generation leader. Yeah, I always ask people if they have something up on GitHub and if, if so, what it is and what kind of problems they solved. And um, many people will say no, and they don't understand what GitHub is. And you know, ultimately your ability to go out there and not only solve a problem, but share it with everybody else out there so people can build solutions on your solution to kind of make it, um, you know, net better uh, than you first put it out is something that kind of escapes people right now. So, so going forward, what would your advice be, James, in terms of getting organizations to train for innovation, get kind of stepping out of the fact we're just kind of updating skills, but we're looking at the way in which we deal with net new skills, the ability to kind of understand that you're going to have to think of new things that aren't out there right now and kind of get out of the out of the realm of the fact that you think it's scary. You know, this is something you expected of you. How do we measure that? How do we put a training plan together? You know, is there a training plan we can put together? You know, what's your advice? Yeah, it starts by making the case for this types of investment. First should be the case around does this help us build a solution that resolves some of our customers' problems? So again, the focus on customer experience being one of the first parts of this. Second is to say, can we, under, can we actually achieve cost efficiencies by using these technologies, which will resonate very well with the CFO, the COO, and others inside of the organization? And then third, if we invest in helping our employees understand these new skills and capabilities, let's make sure that we stay committed to actually doing the use of these things and that I change their KPIs and their focus in their job 
so that they aren't just having to do this on weekends, but they are actually getting to do this new technology we expose them to for 30% of their job or more. Because if we don't do that, we need to be prepared for these employees to take the training, realize they don't get to use it, and leave. So one of the things I used to you know, talk about when I was younger was called dare to be fired. And so the ability to kind of do unnatural things uh, that would uh, probably upset my in my leadership and, you know, think innovative, think differently, um, you know, start off with, the, you know, kind of the uh, the early days of DevOps and the ability to kind of iterate through things and, uh, you know, rapid prototyping and things like that. So. <clears throat> I wasn't rewarded for that behavior. <laughs> I wasn't fired, but ultimately, I think I w people were knocking me back a bit when I was, uh, you know, coming up with this technology. When I people work for me now, they are rewarded for that behavior. I think they they always have an obligation to um, basically increase their net worth to me by innovating as quickly as they can, questioning everything that's out there, trying to redo things to make it better. Uh, iterating through different technological, you know, assertions that we're making and question things that we're, you know, going forward. Maybe containers isn't the best way to do it. We have, you know, is serverless the best way to do it? Is none of the above the best way to do it? Is the ability to kind of leave things where it is the best way to do it? We don't seem to be building that culture in, in terms of training for people out there. And, and, and that kind of drives me nuts. And so, as a leader in the IT field and running different projects, things like that, and you know, I'm running and gunning, and there's probably you know a thousand people like me in my organization, ten thousand people like me in the market right now. What advice would you give to us, them, probably yourself, in terms of you know starting to steer the boat, you know, toward this uh, kind of innovation culture where we're telling people to be disruptive, telling people to do things that they're not being asked to do, to telling people to question things that they're normally not used to questioning. Yeah, for us, the key to that um, is to put forth the use cases where that focus is paying off. For other companies, if it's paying off for other parts of your company who have done it so far, um, and paying off for your ecosystems and your partners because that's what's going to help make the case. Because more often than not, the reason that they are against that is because they have seen no evidence in their own personal lives or careers in which this really does pay off. And so the more you awaken them to the fact that this does work in other companies and other spaces, that's going to be a big catalyst. Yeah, one of the things I used to do when I was uh, uh, CEO of, of a company was, um, you know, I would, if people created something that had a benefit, then they took a percentage of that. And so in one case, you know, we had a, uh, a HIPAA-based product that took off like a rocket and, you know, changed the essence of the company. That person received, you know, 10% of the net benefits of that. A huge amount of money, by the way. Um, that was not well received, I think, by the investors. It was a publicly traded company and by the, the board of directors and by folks out there. But I felt it was fair because I was giving them a small percentage of what they created in the space. But the reaction that it had was not necessarily to motivate that person um, because they were kind of a one and done, you know, kind of thing. But it motivated, you know, the other 500 people I had in research and development to, in essence, think differently about the different systems out there. In the next six month, months, I had, you know, six innovative ideas that were created, uh, you know, different adapter technologies, different ways of doing things. That didn't exist before and probably wouldn't exist unless I spent that money with that person. So is this about making examples of rewards in terms of monetary compensation as well as um, um, ego compensation, the ability to kind of bring somebody up in front of the group, and which I did and said, you know, this person is responsible for increasing our business by 30 percent, you know, net in the next year. So we're going to compensate them this. Here's the, here's the money. And we kind of changed the culture that way. But I haven't tried that again. Is this something that other leaders out there should try? Absolutely. And even if you don't have the financial gains from it, do you have the customer experience gains? Because that can make a big difference. And a lot of times with these innovations, when they first come out, they aren't something you can charge differently for. But if they give the customer a much more rich experience with you, and as a result, they stay more loyal to you, that's a big payoff. Yeah, ultimately, I think it is uh, the ability to kind of balance knowledge with the ability to kind of think differently about things and question things going forward. And we kind of come from a culture 
uh, you know, I'm 56, you know, kind of when I started out, I was told, you know, not to question, you know, don't speak until you're spoken to and, you know, kind of have a, you know, different perspective. And the reality is that was absolutely, that that was actually contrary to what I should be doing. I should be questioning things, different, how things are done, things like that. And I started to do that, you know, when I got into my 30s with integration, application integration, and all these things that I was trying to create kind of net new concepts going forward. But even then, there was kind of pushback, kind of cultural pushback in terms of how these innovations fed until people saw the success of the innovations and everybody kind of got on board. You know, so service-oriented architecture, cloud computing, you know, um, IoT, edge computing, you know, all these things that are kind of emerging these days. So I'm not sure we're at the point where we're necessarily motivating the people with a culture that's going to kind of reward, you know, these kinds of behaviors. And, and I think that's really kind of the focus of training, you know, over the next 10 years is, is how do we change the expectations of not only the people who are doing the real work, you know, the young people in the organization that are doing the, the coding and the developing and the, you know, getting, you know, doing code drops and doing, you know, building applications, but the ability to kind of think differently around the executives who are, you know, typically come from a generation where they weren't necessarily rewarded for thinking differently. So do we have a, uh, kind of a, a quick answer to that? I don't think so. But, you know, what are the processes we need to go through to kind of change our behaviors? Well, and, and innovations can be harder to, to prove the value of these kinds of investments in this kind of training gain. Um, another one that's a little e easier to pay off and a lot of companies need to focus on now is agility. And by investing in these new technologies, can you open up opportunities and ways for your company to iterate its solutions faster, to build out new capabilities faster, and respond to customer needs faster, pay off. Builders want to build. What do you think, Brad? Oh, 100%. I mean, guys, you've covered so much content on, uh, you know, words out of my own mouth on, on a lot of the things we've spoken about on so many different shows as well. I know where to start, really. I think that a big thing for me, and, and, and certainly when I'm talking to people, is what's driving them, what's motivating them, what's going to, you know, flick the switch for their next move in their career, what, are they, what challenges are they really, you know, looking to, to find in the next role, what can they demonstrate already, like you pointed out on GitHub and, and things like that, what, what's out there already that they can, you know, bring to the table that is a, a, a differentiator from the rest of the marketplace with the skill sets that they have you know cultural fits massive you know innovation of where the company's going with a, you know not only the cultural fits got to be right but the direction of the organization its market share how it looks after its customers and, and internal users so there's just so many factors to the, the perfect storm isn't there uh, and I think it's um, I think yeah you guys have just you know covered some great content I'm kind of just <laughs> summarizing uh, how I feel about things and, and sort of touching on touching on points here and there and everywhere but guys I think you've you've pretty much covered it you've, you've gone into a, a great deep dive so I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed that thank you both so much thanks, my pleasure Chris. yeah James look, thanks for being part of the show this week you've taken some great time out to, to do this on your Sunday afternoon so you know thank you so much and look forward to recording the innovation show shortly yeah me too and, and thanks Dave as always a pleasure to have you on the show great great stuff this week it's always a pleasure to be here go Rams <laughs> excellent well look, um, that's obviously uh, an American football term or something isn't it Yes, it is. <laughs> LA, Los Angeles Rams. It's a city in the United States. <laughs> Great. I'm glad we pointed out the geographics of LA. Uh, <laughs> but thanks everyone for watching. We hope you enjoyed watching this week's show. Uh, Dave's on Twitter, which is at David Linthicum. Uh, James is on Twitter, which is at Staten7. I'm on Twitter, which is at Nelson underscore Hilliard. Um, we've got some, all the links are down, uh, down below in the description box. And, uh, you know, thanks for watching. We've had a lot of fun on the shows this week. And uh, remember to like, uh, subscribe, comment and share these videos with your friends and with your colleagues. It means a lot to us. We love all the support we get on social media. That means a lot. So uh, thanks for watching and until next week.